So welcome to Judaism and Decoded Lesson 2. Which is titled nice wrestling illusion there. Code. Uh, deciphering code. And um, as we mentioned in the, uh, in the teaser video last week, um, the, uh, the Torah is split into more than just two. And we, we generally speak about it as the written Torah and the oral Torah. And part of what we introduced last week is that, of course, there's the received part of the oral Torah. That's, of course, the part that we discussed all together last week. But there is also the derived part of the oral Torah. So in your textbooks, we are on page 40. Um, and we're going to begin today's lesson by analyzing an interesting passage from the Medrash. And this will kind of serve as our entryway into tonight's lesson. Uh, Malka, you want to read for us on page 40, text 1. Don't forget to unmute yourself. All right. Go for it. Both the, both the written Torah and the Ora Torah are God-given. What is the difference between them? This can be compared to a king who had two subjects, whom he loved very much and to whom he gave each a measure of wheat and a bundle of flax. The wise subject took the flax and wove a beautiful cloth. He took the wheat, turned it into fl fine flour, shifted it, ground it, kneaded it, baked it, and set it upon the table and spread the cloth over it until the king came. But the foolish subject did nothing at all with what he was given. When the king returned to his palace, he said to his two subjects, my sons, bring me what I gave you. The wise subject presented the bread made from the fine flour with the cloth spread over it. The foolish subject presented raw wheat in a container with the raw flax on top of it. How great was his shame and disgrace. When God gave Israel the Torah, he presented it only in the form of wheat and flax, leaving us to extract the fine flour and to weave a garment. So clearly, thank you, Malcolm. So clearly the, the, uh, the point being presented here is that we would be foolish to return the Torah to God exactly as he gave it to us. In other words, God has given us the Torah and he presented it to us in the form of wheat and flax. He's given it to us as raw materials and we should take it and run with it. Have a good time. Uh, uh, enjoy it. Uh, spend it. Um, turn it into something better than what God gave it to us with. Uh, and that's why the... the the son in the, in the analogy, the, 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 the prince, the son of the king, who uses, who returns the, uh, the wheat and flax exactly as they are, is actually called foolish. Um, now, here's my question for discussion for you on page 41. Is text one consistent with our definition and understanding of oral Torah as was presented in lesson one? Anybody want to wanna give us some, some insight here? So remember, last week we discussed that all oral Torah is received. It all comes from Hashem. It was all given to us by God, even though it might not have been written down, but it was given. And you see this from the Torah itself. There were so many places we proved it, etc. Now we have this medrash that tells us that we're being given wheat and, and, um, and flax to turn into better products. To me, they would seem completely inconsistent views. So was it given to us as it was given rigid by God and it was just that it wasn't written down? Is that what the oral Torah is? Or is the oral Torah something we're supposed to contribute to the Torah? But this is where we get to our second step, right? So we had the received oral Torah, which was the God-given explanations for every one of the commandments exactly how to do it. And today, the topic of today's lesson is we're going to introduce for the first time section two or category two of the oral Torah, which is the derived portion of the oral Torah. Laws that we derive from the written Torah and, and the received oral Torah. In other words, there are lots of, of, of elements, whether it's words, uh, exercises, uh, nuances, that we can find in both the written Torah, which was passed down to us directly from God, and the oral Torah, which was passed down to us directly from God. In other words, that received part. And when we look at those two, we can derive more information. And that's where we're supposed to bring our part to the table. Um, so just like last week, when we spoke about the received part of the oral Torah, we tackled two points. Number one is why it would be important. In other words, last week we were discussing why the written law wasn't important and we needed to have the oral law. And number two is weird, bring me proof from the written Torah itself 
that the oral Torah exists and is necessary and, and you don't have the full picture without it. And uh, so this week we're going to do exactly the same thing. So let's start uh, on page 42 with why isn't, uh, sorry, uh, uh, why even in the oral Torah, the received oral Torah is not enough and we need to have the derived oral Torah. Because if you think about it, this question should be popping right now out in everybody, in every, in direct, directly in everybody's face. Isn't the written Torah, together with the received oral Torah, good enough? They both came directly from God. Some of it he wrote down, some of it he gave to us orally. I get it. The parts that he gave to us orally, I get it. Maybe they didn't all fit in the Torah. Maybe God wanted us to pass it down to give us that ability to, do, to pass down Father and Son. Maybe... Maybe it'll be better understood that way. He'll avoid the broken telephone game. Remember, we played that last week. Why is the derived oral Torah necessary? Right? Why should we have things that we can read into the Torah? Um, and soon we're going to talk about the fact that that might be a recipe for disaster. Because if you let people derive their own interpretations of the Torah, you're probably going to end up in trouble. Um, so let's open up our uh, uh, conversation about the derived oral Torah by turning back to that same Maimonides. Uh, Maimonides is the great Jewish philosopher, 14th century, uh, sorry, uh, 12th century, who, uh, who, who, in his introduction to the Mishnah, shares with us these different categories of the oral Torah. Um, David, you said your book is not here yet? Not yet. Right, okay, so uh, Shimon, why don't you read for us? We're on page 42, text two. Okay. Uh, God told Moses, the written verse, you shall live in booths for seven days, Leviticus 23, 42. He also told Moses that this mitzvah is obligatory for males, but not for females, that the sick and travelers are not required to fulfill this mitzvah, that the roof of the sukkah must be made of something that grows from the ground, that the roof cannot be made from wool, wool silk, or any other item that does not grow from the ground, nor from mats and clothing even if they were made from something that grows from the ground. That one should eat, drink, and sleep in the sukkah for all seven days. That the size of the sukkah should be no smaller than seven hand breaths long by seven hand breaths wide. And that the sukkah should be no less than 10 hand breaths in height. Thank you, Shimon. So, so far Rabbi, we have right here. Yes. Rabbi, can you, I, I was on my iPhone before. Can you let me in on the computer, please? It's easier to see. Absolutely. I don't see you waiting, though. Uh, yeah. Are you using the correct link for this? Because tonight is a different link than most nights. No, I'm sorry. I'm not. Okay. Sorry. Oh, okay. Forgive me. No I'm sorry. sorry. As soon as I yeah. see you, it's okay. As soon as I see you waiting, I'll let you in. Okay. Thank you. So th thank you, Shimon, for reading for us. So here we have an example of something. Uh, my mom is just showing us something that has both the written law, right? There is, you shall live in booths for seven days. That's a verse directly out of Leviticus. It's from the Torah itself. And then we have, my Maimonides is sharing with us, the received oral Torah. Words that come directly from God that were passed down to Moses through this very patient system. You remember that system where all the students were coming in and out to make sure they were double and triple checking each other. And they were hearing the Torah over and over again from God to Moses and Moses to Aaron, from Aaron to his children, from his children to the, to the elders and the elders to the rest of the Jewish people. And then they went out into clusters and those clusters fought each other. That thorough system. So they... they took this verse, they were, they were using this verse as an anchor, you shall live in booths for seven days, which we know is the sukkah, and then they were learning all the rest of this paragraph that Shimon just read for us here. Anybody still have some questions? There's a lot of details there, but anybody still have some questions about a sukkah? I have a lot of them. <laughs> yes. Okay, go for it, Lisa. Um, it says, uh, be made from, of something that grows from the ground. Yes. Uh, the, the words were actually hand-shaped palms uh, in the Torah, in the written. Uh, um, you're, I think you're conflating two it, but, it's, but it was in verse 40. It wasn't in verse 42. One second. I think you're conflating two mitzvahs. There is the mitzvah of shaking the lulav. That's supposed to be a palm. Mm -hmm. And then there's the sukkah. The top of the sukkah doesn't necessarily need to be a right, bomb. It's just that, a few pieces. No, this was, this was the top of the sukkah. Okay. In, in verse 40, it says that it should be specifically palms? Yeah. I'll, I'll look it up. Palms. Hold on. 
It's a good thing we all have phones, so these days we can just get a chumash on in a, in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pull it up like that. I can answer your question. I don't remember offhand. So we're in Leviticus, we're in 2340, you're saying, yes? Correct. No, that's specifically with regards to the, to the that's the four species there. The, ver, the full verse is, well, the oh, first okay. we shall, we shall okay. take, we shall take the product of Hadar trees, which is the, 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 the right. echo that we're familiar with, branches of palm trees, which is the lulav, bows of leafy trees, which is the, uh, the hadas, or the myrtle, and willows of the brook. I'm actually, it's, it's actually interesting you should mention this. Oh, I'm okay. actually in the middle of studying with a different student the Talmudic section on this part to understand exactly why those are the four species. But let's stay focused for a moment on the sukkah. So the, the verse tells okay, us I'm one sorry. simple thing. The verse tells us you shall live in booths for seven days. Obviously, immediately we have questions. How big can that booth be? What should that booth be made out of? I said, okay, no problem. We have the oral Torah to the rescue, right? The received oral Torah tells us that it should be made of something that grows to the ground. The roof cannot be made of wool, silk, or any other item, et cetera, et cetera. All these different things. You should eat, you should drink, et cetera. But there's a lot that's left out of the received oral Torah, right? For instance, we said that there's a minimal height. It should be 10, 10 hand breaths tall. But is there a maximum height? Can we just have skyscraper tall Sukkot? What about a Sukkah that, ha that, that I have in my yard all year round? Does it need to be a Sukkah that's designated for the holiday? Maybe I have this nice hut outside and it happens to fit all the parameters. Am I allowed to use an old Sukkah? Does a Sukkah require a mezuzah? Here's a random question, right? It's a temporary dwelling, but it's a dwelling that the Torah tells us to be in. Does a Sukkah require a mezuzah? The received oral Torah says that one should eat and drink in the Sukkah for all seven days. Does this mean even a small snack? What about a glass of water? What if I have a tiny nibble, but it's actually the most expensive caviar in the world? So it's a tiny little nibble, but it's something very, very special. All these questions were left unanswered from the received oral Torah. Um, so you could try to build a basic sukkah based on the laws in, in the written Torah, to, right, which we have on the top there. You shall live in a, in a booth for seven days. And the received Torah, which gave us a minimum height, right? And, which you, and you could definitely build like a basic sukkah, but inevitably questions are going to arise. By, by the way, all, not all of those questions are going to be before the fact. Sometimes we're going to wonder, oh, I, I didn't even realize there might have been a height limit. I had a sukkah, which was 20 feet tall. Is that kosher or not? It's too late now. But I want to know, for, you know, like sometimes they come up because of practicalities. Um, even more, come again? I, I thought someone was asking something. Um, and, and, and by the way, this can apply to every single mitzvah, right? In, in the Torah, it says, you should put a mezuzah, mezuzah, betecha, bisharecha. You should put a mezuzah on the side of your doorpost and on your home. Does every door of your house need a mezuzah or just the front door, right? Does the back door need one as well? What about the door to my garage? What about the door to the bathroom, right? What about the door to a little cabinet, the little <coughs> cabinet that I have? Oh, so there's a minimum size that a room needs to be. What about a maximum size, right? All of these questions <coughs> would arise with regards to any mitzvah under the sun, even if you have the written law, and then you have the received oral tradition, you would still have many questions. Um, and by the way, we have only touched the surface because we haven't spoken yet about changing circumstances, right? We all know that there are lots of circumstances that with changing technology, changing times, et cetera, lots of questions begin to apply to us. Here are some of them, right? Does a mobile home need a mezuzah, right? Uh, and where would it need to have a mezuzah then? Would it need to have a mezuzah only on the living quarters? Or would it need to have it on the doors of, our, of, of, of the passenger seat and the, and, the, and the driver's seat? If you say it doesn't need to have it here, does every car need to have a mezuzah at the door of the car? <laughs> I haven't seen that yet. <laughs> it actually reminds me, I always keep like a stash of like two or three mezuzahs. I remember this because just yesterday I ran out that I keep just in case I, I meet someone and they want to buy a mezuzah on, on the spot that they want me to put it up. I have one. You know, I should never be, I just like I have a pair of tefillin in my car. Always, just in case I meet someone I can put on tefillin with them, I always have mezuzahs. So I have mezuzahs in my car, but I'm going to venture to say nobody else on, on this, uh, in this class has mezuzahs on their car, right? But cars weren't even around back then. And I don't even know if, if dune buggies can be compared, right? What about uh, 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 mitzvahs with regards to saving a life, right? Ventilators. This is a very current, current question right now, right? People have coronavirus. They end up in certain situations. Do we need to provide a ventilator to everyone? Are the elderly more important? Are, and there are laws, by the way, about saving a life. But those laws might not, might not, might not be applicable to a ventilator. But they, they most probably aren't without at least some sort of derivation or implication being used, right? Without any 
without some sort of exercise, you're not going to get that from the Torah. There's, there was no such thing as a ventilator. You know, think, think about talking to somebody who lived in the times of Sinai 3,000 years ago. You can tell them, yeah, we have this machine now. It can breathe for you. You know how you say breathing you got to do on your own? That's the one thing you got to do on your own? No, no, we can do that for you too. He's going to look at you like you fell off the moon. You, you're expecting there to be laws like that in the Torah, but yet the Torah is supposed to be our source of life. The Torah is supposed to be telling us always how to live, right? So these are instances where we see that the derived Torah is necessary. We're going to get to it in a moment. We're going to, we're going to explore this fully. Um, here's another example, right? The date line is a big one. That's one that the Rebbe dealt with at, at, at great length. The Rebbe spoke about this a lot. Um, crossing the date line, right? So does that mean that all of a sudden I have a five-day week, right? I'm in a plane. I go over the date line. I, I jump a day ahead because I'm going to Australia or whatever, right? Does that mean I now have only a, a five-day week and then I observe Shabbat? Because just because everybody else in Australia is observing Shabbat, but the Torah tells us it's supposed to be six days and then Shabbat. You're supposed to work for six days and then on the seventh day you rest. So how does that work? And just to make it more complicated, because right now we find ourselves in Sefirah to Omer, right? So tonight, uh, um, sorry, last night we counted, I think it was 43 or was it 42? I don't remember exactly. Um, and every night we count the Omer. Once if somebody flies, as I did, by the way, once, I once flew back from... Uh, um, it was Australia. I went all the way to Australia. I went to Bangkok and into Australia. And then, I, and then this is like seven years ago. And I had to fly all the way back to New York, right? And I actually chose to avoid the complications and fly the long way around the world so as never to cross the date line and not be unsure as to what I should count, what, which day of the Omer I should count. Because if I skip a day or I lose a day, so what, do I count the same day twice or do I just skip one day of the counting? But the Omer is, is supposed to be a, a complete counting. Right? We say that every night. It's supposed to be seven weeks of complete counting. Right? Is a technology, of course, right? Is it okay to use a hidden camera in your home to keep an eye on your nanny? Right? These are, these are laws of privacy. Now, let me explain to you something. The Torah has, meaning many of you might not be familiar with this, the Torah has lots of laws about privacy. There are laws, for instance, about windows. Are you allowed to build a window if your neighbor's house is right next door and you're going to see into his yard? What's if your window preceded his yard and then he decided to make a yard there afterwards, right? Am I, am I in violating his privacy or am I not violating his privacy? There are all sorts of laws about that many of you may not be familiar with, but they exist, right? Here's the question, though. When it starts to become more technologically tricky, like it's much more modern question, like, like this nanny cam, right? By the way, another one with cameras is, and this is one that I'm dealing with right now, I, I actually just want a Nest system. Raise your hand if you have a Nest system at home. Like a thermostat. A Nest thermostat, anyone? Arnold, Shimon, Lisa, Catherine, nobody? Malka? All right. Everybody, is everybody familiar with what they are? I'm not. So Nest thermostats are one of these smart home devices that's supposed to help save you, save you uh, uh, money on your, on, your, on your electric bill. It's a smart thermostat. So it connects to your smartphone, and it can tell when you're home and when you're not home. You know, whenever your smartphone is not in the house, it turns off the AC, just in case you forget it's in the house. You can set schedules on it. If you're upstairs in your bed, and you're just too lazy to go downstairs and turn it up or turn it down, you can change the temperature from right there, or you can turn the AC off for the night, right? Which might save you 20 bucks in one night. Um, mm -hmm. If you, right? But they, they're also obviously, they've got lots of sensors on them, right? Walking in front of a sensor like that on Shabbat, which is telling the thermostat, turn on, turn off, or whatever it is, right? Is that allowed on Shabbat? In, 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 uh, uh, much more recently, we have these now smart uh, Google Homes and Alexas and, and those things. Raise your hands, you have one of those at home. Are you allowed to use it on Shabbat? If you by mistake say the word Alexa, are you violating Shabbat because you turned on a machine? These are all great questions that obviously you're never going to find the answer to, not in the written Torah. And not, in the, not even in the orally transmitted part of the Torah, which we're transmitting perfectly because this is how we got it from God. Right? So. Now what do we do here? here? Yes, exactly. So, so now what do we do here? Very good question. So in, uh, in, let, let, me, let, let me just clarify one thing. There is an underlying assumption here. Okay? There is an underlying assumption. And I don't know if anybody has this question, but let me just address it just in case. The underlying assumption here is that we want to do everything perfectly, that we want to do every single mitzvah perfectly. For instance, with the sukkah, some of you are sitting and you're like, seriously, I didn't even care if there was a minimum height for a sukkah. Now you're telling me there might be a maximum height for a sukkah. I'm, I build a sukkah, I sit in it, that's what God wants, I'm doing great. I need to do it exactly in the right way. When it comes to secular holidays, for instance, right, Thanksgiving, does anybody ask you what's the legal amount of how much turkey you need to eat on Thanksgiving in order to be yotze, in order to fulfill the, the mitzvah of eating turkey on Thanksgiving? Or how loud the fireworks need to be on the 4th of July? Nobody asks you these questions, right? Um, so obviously, the idea here is that we're trying to get God's word 
directly correct because it, because, it's, because it's the word of Hashem and because these are mitzvot and because these have a very powerful spiritual energy that we're trying to tap into. And if we don't get it right, it's not going to work. Um, Thanksgiving and the Fourth of July would not be great examples for these things, but think about places where these things are extremely important. If anybody has ever f- filled out any sort of government form, you know that if you get even one field wrong, right? Boom, you're kaput, it's over. Um, I, I don't think we have anybody from JPL on today, right? Nobody here from JPL. But those at JPL know that when it comes to NASA and engineering and those sorts of things, everything is exact. There's no getting things wrong because when things actually matter to you, you might, <laughs> um, everybody, has, well, many people have a spouse or a loved one or somebody, right? If they get you a birthday gift and it's just one day late, right? It's late. It's late. It's the wrong day. They didn't remember your birthday, right? Because that's something that means something to you. So obviously, if, if we are trying to connect with Hashem and we want these mitzvahs to mean something to us, we want to get everything right. So what do we do from here, like Arnold says, right? What do we do? We have the, or, we have the written Torah. We have the oral Torah as it was transmitted. In other words, the, 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 the received part of the oral Torah that we got directly from Hashem, person to person to person. But what about, sorry, I skipped this last slide. What about the, um, the, the rest of, of, of the application to today's day and age? What about the rest of the laws that are not written in the, in the received oral Torah? So for this, we move on to text three. Arnold, you want to read for us? I'll put it up on the screen because I, I left my book. Oh, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't have it on the screen. I don't have the, the digital one. We're on page 43. Lisa, you want to read for us? There you go. Perfect. <laughs> you're good, you're good. We hear you. Page okay. 43, text three. Thank you. It is impossible that God's Torah could ever be complete in such a way that it would be sufficient for all times. For, the, for there are constantly new details, judgments, and events in human affairs, and the laws about these matters would be far too numerous to be enumerated. Thank you, Lisa. And just because I happen to hear every, the bells going off in everybody's head because they saw the word God and impossible in the same sentence, and we're saying that something is impossible for God, let me just uh, qualify that. Absent a miracle, it would be impossible for God to include every single detail inside one book or even a series of books, or even, I don't know, the biggest series of books that existed, right? Every single detail of every single mitzvah as it would apply for every single generation, okay? Um, now, it's important to understand that the Talmud tells us that God avoids miracles at all costs. Unless it's extremely important, he doesn't make miracles. Um, so he... he, he we're not looking to answer this by saying, oh, God could have miraculously made some sort of Torah that, 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 that would have done this for us. So what are we left with? We're left with derivation, which means that there should be general rules laid down, and then it should be up to us as the Jewish people to derive or to get out of the Torah all of the answers to all of our questions as to every single mitzvah with every single detail, and then to... Um, to apply it to every scenario as the world keeps changing. Um, you know, secular legal systems face a similar challenge. Uh, this happens all the time. Um, the, 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 there will be some sort of, uh, uh, you know, document. Last week we brought the example of the, the Constitution, and we, we'll talk about that again in learning exercise number one in just a moment. Um, but but their, their solution is pretty much as follows. You have a judiciary. And their job is to interpret and apply existing legislation, right? And then you have another option, which is you have a legislator, which is his job is to enact new legislation. These are your two choices. Either you interpret and apply existing legislation or you enact new legislation. Now, the judiciary needs to interpret and apply existing legislation. That, 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 um, that solution that the secular courts have Right? I'm not talking about brand new laws that come out of today's day and age. Oh, the internet comes out, we need to put out a new law that dictates the internet exactly what happens because nobody has ever dealt this before. The Torah doesn't do that. And, and we could talk about, meaning, we're going to talk about legislated later. The rabbis do do that. And we'll talk about that in next week's lesson. I think it's next week's lesson, maybe it's the week afterwards. But what we are going to talk about today is judiciary systems. In other words, people whose job it is to interpret and apply existing legislation and figure out what is the truth about it? Now, the most important thing when it comes to deriving or trying to interpret and apply existing verses in the Torah 
and the oral Torah that we have received that accompanies it is going to be getting it right, right? And making sure we don't just leave a free flow of people to interpret it however they'd like to, which obviously would leave room for corruption. So let's start by doing learning exercise number one. Sorry. Uh, learning exercise number one in your textbook on page 44. For those of you who don't have the textbook in front of you, hopefully it'll be coming uh, today, tomorrow. Um, this exercise has as follows. It has the Third Amendment to the United States Constitution. And it states as follows. No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Here's the question for you. Which of the following statements do you think can reasonably be derived from this amendment? Number one, it should be unconstitutional for a school to forbid teachers and principals from taking outside employment. Number two, it should be unconstitutional for the government to issue rent control laws. Do we have any votes here? Anybody? Shimon, what do you think? Can you see any of these being taken out of, out of, out of the Third Amendment to the Constitution? Malika, any of them? <laughs> no. When I, when I saw this, I started to laugh. I was like, I, I don't even see the connection. Like there's... No. D no. But my friends... The, the, the first one uh, does not apply because they're teachers. It, do, it doesn't apply because they're talking about soldiers. Okay. Second okay. one doesn't doesn't apply because um, it just it, it just doesn't <laughs> apply. Period. It's fucking. Lisa, about what, what if I told you? What if I told you that both of these are legitimate assertions that were actually presented in a U.S. court of law? And if you'd like to, in your textbook, I think it's on page. Um, I think it's in the additional readings at the back. I think they have them quoted. This is actually going to take a little bit too much time, so let's skip that step. But these were actually things that were presented in the U.S. Court of Law. I believe that both of them were rejected. Um, but I, I, I think it's important to understand the, the point we're making here. If you have an agenda, I don't know the historical background behind the people who suggest, who, who asserted these things in the, in the U.S. courts to try to, to, to derive these laws out of the Third Amendment to, to, to the U.S. Constitution. But I would imagine one of them was a teacher and one of them was, was a tenant. Anybody with me here? Probably, right? Or, or, or one of them was not a teacher, was a, 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 a superintendent or whatever, right? In other words, if you have an agenda to get something done, you will find how it can be derived from and how to interpret the law to figure out how it will apply to you. And this is obviously the, the biggest flaw that there is when it comes to deriving anything from, from the Torah, right? If I'm a rabbi and I'd like to allow X, Y, and Z, I'm going to go to the Torah and I'm going to try to get it allowed. So I'm going to figure out and I'm going to use my head and I'm going to come up with all sorts of creative ideas how to interpret the Torah in my way so that it should fit my, my, my agenda, right? So this is, I mean, and, and <laughs> the challenge actually becomes way harder when you look at the opening text of today's lesson, right? So if you go back to... Um, to uh, text one, and they bring it again now in text four, you can see it in your textbook, both the written, on page 45, both the written Torah and the oral Torah are God-given. So if we're assuming that the oral Torah here, the derived oral Torah, can we assume that that is God-given? And, and what makes it so? If it's a whole bunch of rabbis, or a whole bunch of wise men, or maybe even not wise men, people trying to figure out from the Torah, how to apply it to a, a, a nest uh, thermostat that has a sensor on it, right? And the Torah never spoke about this. So one person will bring proof from one part of the Torah that this is true, and one person that it's not true. And you know, I, 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 you know, you'll get all sorts of opinions here, and probably most of them won't be right. So, so <laughs> presumably, if we go back to that analogy with the, with the, uh, with the wheat and the cloth, Right with the, with the wheat and the flax and the bread and the cloth, the the, the 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 king who gave his two sons right and told them to make it into something. He obviously had a clear agenda, right? If the uh, if the son would have taken the wheat and turned it into a beautiful necklace, clearly he would have not gotten the point, right? Even though he would have made something out of it, he would have bettered it. Clearly, that wasn't the point. He spent some time thinking about it. What is wheat usually used for? And he figured out that that's the goal for what his father had in mind. So, presumably, it was the same way. Now, now he, they had 
general societal uses to go based on. But what is, what is the set of rules? What is the set of parameters which we're going to give the rabbis because there's got to be something, otherwise they're going to go be all over the place. Right? What is the set of parameters which, we're, which the rabbis are going to have to keep to when they're trying to interpret the written law and the received oral law? Right? What is that set of parameters? So, lucky for you guys, you have textbooks in front of you. Page 45, text 5, we actually get those parameters. Um, our, uh, Catherine, you want to read for us? Go ahead. Uh, we just need you to unmute yourself. Okay. Unmute yourself. There we okay. go. Now we hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Both text five. Torah and our Torah are God uh, No, no, text five. Text five. Five. Okay, sorry. These are the rules that you, Moses, shall set before them. Exodus 20, 1 1. Rabbi Ishmael says, These are the 13, uh, 13 hermeneutic rules of Torah derivation which were given to Moses at Sinai. So imagine if the king in the analogy had not just given bread, sorry, had not just given wheat and flax, but he had actually given them wheat and let's say a, uh, a, a, a grinder. And he would have given the one with the flax, he would have given him a loom, which is like a weaving device, right? It would have been very clear to them exactly what the food set was. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when Hashem gave us the Torah, He gave us a set of rules. And that set, meaning He gave us obviously the, the oral Torah, received Torah, but He also gave us a set of rules for deriving things from the Torah. And Rabbi Yishmael lists 13 of them. And by the way, for those of you that attend morning minyan or, or who have ever attended a morning service at any shul, immediately before Hodu, immediately before we start with Kaddish, um, meaning when we officially start the prayers, the last part of the preliminary prayers that we say is actually every single day we list these 13 principles. And that's because as Jews, we want to try to connect to the Torah as much as we can. So we keep these 13 principles <clears throat> always at the forefront of our minds. So these 13 principles, I'd like to take some time, and, and, and these are laws, these are rules that we have to specifically follow. Um, if you'd like to, in depth. come again? They're in depth. They're pretty specific. Um, we're actually gonna we're, we're gonna unravel at least two of them today. All right. We're we're actually gonna use them. We'll bring examples of them, and we're gonna explain them. But before I do so, let me just explain what these thirteen rules are. Okay. There are thirteen. They're called hermeneutic principles. But basically, what they are is they're they're uh, legal ramifications, which will which you'll have to use any time you want to derive something from the Torah. It will have to be a based on one of these 13, and B, if you're using one of the 13, you're gonna to have to use it to the full extent of exactly how it is. So think about it for instance, and uh, before we continue, I'd like to say that the following example uh, was given by Rabbi Yitzhi Horowitz, the following analogy. I think it should make it very clear to you exactly what these 13 principles are, and it is my hope that by using this example as part of our uh, you know, learning today, uh, may Rabbi Yitzhi Horowitz, who was stricken with ALS about seven years ago, I think it is now. Um, and he, he used to be a rabbi in Temecula, California. Now he lives in Los Angeles. And we hope that one day soon he'll have a foolish name of Karova. So let this learning be in his uh, honor that he should have a, a full and complete recovery. His name is Joseph Yitzhak ben -Brach. His example was, think about it like a Sudoku board, right? You see those numbers that, uh, uh, raise your hands, everybody knows how to play Sudoku? Yes, yeah, Malka, you know how at least no. you know, Sudoku? <laughs> No. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I'll give you the laws, the, the rules really quickly. But basically, the, any Sudoku board will come and it'll look exactly as it looks right now. The numbers that you see, those have to stay where they are. You have to try to fill in all the rest of them with the rest of the numbers and make sure every single row has only numbers one through nine. Every single column has every single row, has every single number one through nine. And every square of nine Squares, you see how there's like nine squares with, a, with a, a boulder line around them. Each one of those also has to have the numbers one through nine. So let me ask you guys a question. For the Sudoku players here, if I were to complete this Sudoku game and fill in all the numbers, would you look at me and say, oh, you made it up? You made up the rest of the numbers? You haven't figured out what the game designer said? Absolutely not. Every single one of you would know, if I got it right, you would look at it. Based on the existing numbers, you would know that I got the intent of the game designer 
100% to a T. Absolutely, you would know that. Why? Because think of these numbers as a written Torah and received oral Torah. You cannot go against that. You're not allowed to change words from the Torah. Nothing is allowed to go against clear words from the Torah. Nothing is allowed to go against the received oral Torah, which is a whole list of things and explanations of exactly what an etrog looks like and what the filling looks like, etc. Right? And then you obviously have many questions which are left unanswered. You think of those as the empty spaces. And therefore, we need to derive laws. But we cannot just come to any conclusion. There are rules, right? The way that you put in the numbers is only by following the rules that you can succeed in tapping into the divine intent. Just like in Sudoku, when you follow the rules of exactly how it's supposed to be, right? Then you actually get the exact numbers that the game designer intended. Similarly, if we use the written Torah and the oral Torah, and then we use these 13 hermeneutic rules, this is exactly how you do it. In this game, there are three rules. Every row has to have all the numbers, every column has to have all the numbers, and every box has to have all the, all the numbers, right? It, it's exactly the same thing with the Torah. So, principles. All right, you guys ready for this? We're about to get deep. Please sit, sit, up, sit up straight. We're about to get, uh, we're gonna do some real Talmud here, okay? We're gonna do some real pretend Talmud learning here, okay? What, what I'm going to attempt to do with you today is give you two of the principles, two of the guiding rules, rules of the game, all right? It's just as easy as Sudoku, only 10 times more difficult. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm going to give you two rules of the game, and I'm going to give you examples and analogies, and I'm going to challenge those rules, and I'm going to bring you into the Talmud. And my goal is going to be to show you that when you use those rules, and the Talmud challenges them and challenges them until it's, it's literally, there's no other way you could have done it you're actually going to get to the truth of what the written Torah and the received oral Torah were trying to say. All right. Ask question. Yes, now is the time to ask. Okay. We have no feedback from God, do we, about whether we've got this correct? Did God ever say, yes, you've got that, you're, you're interpreting this correctly, or these, I agree with these, well, you've got these principles correct, whereas with well, Sudoku... Oh, the principles? The principles were passed down from Sinai. Okay. Okay. Think about it exactly. Like, think about it exactly like a game of of of, uh, of, of, uh, of Sudoku. The rules are given to you by the game designer, but you have to fill it all in. And at least for the average Sudoku player, all the Sudoku games that I've ever done, I never got to meet the game designer. And yet, I know 100% with certainty that I got it right. So, can I ask you a quick question then? Absolutely. Go for the, it. To our interpretation, all the commentaries and everything. Does yes. God ever say? let us know that we're heading in the wrong path with the commentaries? That's, that's not what he actually intended? When you say commentary, what do you mean? Interpretation. There's lots board. of commentary. You're yeah. saying when we derive something from, from a verse, let's do it, Shimon. Let's see if you still have this question once you see it in action, okay? We're going to do this twice today. Okay. All right? Sounds good? We're going to yeah. use two of the rules. I, 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 maybe some of you are familiar with some of these rules. Does any, has anybody ever done this before? Have you ever taken one of the 13 hermeneutic principles? the 13 rules of Rabbi Ishmael and attempted to analyze the verse based on them. This is done in the Talmud all the time. I have not done that. You've never done that. I've okay. never done a verse. Have you, I mean, have you ever understood the rules? Have you understood how they work? I thought I did. I think I do. <laughs> okay, let's do them. Let's do two of them, okay? There are 13 of these, be in mind. Here's number one, okay? Number one is called a kal v'chomer, okay? What is a kal v'chomer? A kal v'chomer means when you have something weak, and something strong, okay? Everybody see the beautiful illustration here? Something weak and something strong, and you can attempt to learn from the weak thing to the strong thing, all right? Or from the strong thing to the weak thing, all right? How does this work? Here's an example. You ask your boss for an extra hour of lunch. She refuses, saying that there's an important deadline to meet. Question for the audience. Should you ask to take the day off? You can feel free to nod your head or shake your head. You just asked her for an hour off, right? You just asked her for an, to, to, for an extra hour of lunch. She said, no, there's an extremely important deadline coming up. Should you ask for the day off? No. Anybody? No. No. Well, no. Lisa, no. Anybody think no. you should ask? Absolutely not. Can you explain your reasoning to me? Question. Yes. Yes. I, I, I would say no because Go ahead, David. It's, it's jeopardizing your job for one. Why is it jeopardizing your job? You only asked her for an hour off of lunch, and she said no. Now you're asking her for a completely separate thing, which is take a day off. 
Well, and the, probably the, you the can only, do it without asking her. The only time I I would be adamant if, if it was a deep principle. If it was no, a I deep understand. principle. I understand. Deep. Here's my question, David. The question is, I gave you one piece of information. You asked her for an hour, an extra hour of lunch, right? And she said no. How is that informing your decision? And, and she said because she has an important deadline. How is that informing your decision about taking a day off? I'd say yes. Go for it. You'd say yes, Malka. Yeah. I have a feeling you'd be fired. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I would say yes. <laughs> you would still say you would still say you yeah. would try to take the day off. If I needed to have that day off, I'd abs I would Okay, let's not talk about let's not talk about the fact that you need it. We're talking now in terms of your boss, what your boss wants. I don't know. You I know that she doesn't yes. want you to take the day off. Why? Here's the logic, guys. You, you guys all know this. You're just not using the right words. If she didn't want you to take an hour off, she certainly doesn't want you to take the day off. Okay? Right. That is essentially a Kyle Bachomer, right? If he, does, if, she does, if he doesn't allow you to take the day off, an hour off, he certainly won't allow you to take off a whole day. In short, if you look inside your textbook, figure 2.3 on page 47, Kyle Bachomer, the translation of it is weak and strong. In other words, to infer from the less obvious to the more, excuse me, to the more obvious case, in English, this is in, in uh, excuse me, in Latin, this is called a fortiori. I never heard of it before, but I, heard, I hear about it now. In short, if I tell you you cannot have one dollar, if you ask me for a, for, for, uh, for a loan, you ask me for a dollar, and I say no, is it smart to ask you for a hundred bucks? Absolutely not. That's a silly, that's a silly question to ask because you can infer from a Kal Bachomer that I won't allow you to have it. Let's see how this works in the Torah, okay? Got it. Okay. We have a verse. Oh, one second. We have a verse. Here's the verse. Text 6b. Uh, Malka, you want to read for us? If a man gives his neighbor a donkey, a bull, a lamb, or an any animal for safekeeping, and it dies, breaks a limb, or is captured, the bailey need not pay. But if it is stolen from him, he shall pay its owner. Okay. So, um, if I hire a custodian, all right? Malta, you're my custodian. I give you my, let's not say cow, I give you my iPhone. And I tell you, please do me a favor. Hold, uh, the truth is, I guess my iPhone is not a good example. Okay, I give you my animal. I give you my dog, all right? Your dog's sitting for me, Malta, all right? No problem. I'm even paying you for it. I'm giving you 100 bucks a day to dog sit for me. I know, lucrative job, right? Quit your day job now. All right. Um, I give you my dog. I say, Malka, please watch this for me. And while you have it, something happens. All right? Something goes wrong. And when I come back a week later from my vacation in Hawaii, I know I'm making you all salivate. Everybody's dying to go on vacation now, right? Okay. Um, I come back a week later from my vacation in Hawaii, Malka, because I'm sorry I don't have your dog. Now we have two scenarios. Scenario number one is Malka tells me it died. Sorry, it died. Now we're not talking about Malka shot it, okay? Heaven forbid. It died of natural causes. Um, second scenario is it was stolen, all right? Says the Torah, here's the law. If it died, Malka does not need to pay. She's not responsible as my custodian for my dog to be responsible if the dog dies. <laughs> if she was, every time my dog got really old, I would just give it to Malka. <laughs> I make a lot of money that way, right? Because it would die on Malka's watch and that she would need to pay me back. Obviously, everybody understands that I can't do that. But if it's stolen, I tell Malka, I don't understand. What was I paying you 100 bucks a day for, Malka? Mm -hmm. yeah. You let somebody steal, steal my dog? That's what you were paid for, to watch it, right? Okay, everybody understands why there's two different laws with regards to it. Okay, so far we have that law. Next law, all right? Text 6B, Malka, keep going. So till now, we were talking about a custodian. Malka was watching my dog. In text 6b, what if Malka borrowed my dog? Go ahead. If, if a person borrows an animal from his neighbor and it breaks a limb or dies, he, he shall surely, surely pay. Okay, so this is a second law. If Malka is borrowing the dog from me, she tells me I need a dog because, I don't know, my husband is going out of town and I feel very insecure if there's no dog at home, I don't feel safe. Please, if you can do me a favor, I'm actually still in Pasadena. I'm happy to keep my dog at home. Malka says, do me a favor. Lend me your dog, your friend. Lend it to me. Let me have it in my house. And then I'll feel safe at home because I have a dog here. Now, while Malka has the dog, it dies. Says the Torah, 
because she borrowed it, she has more responsibility than she does as a custodian, right? Because right. I'm doing her a favor. She's the one who chose to go into this. And okay, so she's responsible to pay for it, even if it dies on her watch. All right. Here's the question. Million dollar question. We don't have information about what's going to happen if, Ma if, the, if, if Malka borrows my dog and then it doesn't die. It is stolen. What are your thoughts? Um, let's start with Elise. What do you think? Remember, use the, use the verses that we do have already as your guiding principle. Elise, you want to try? Uh, I guess there's a bad connection there. All right, uh, Catherine, you want to try? What do you think? I think he's still liable. You think Malka is still liable? Oh. Do you have a way that you can explain why liable. she's liable? Yeah. You um, want, sorry, Elise? Okay, Catherine, you want to explain to us why? Why do you think that if it's stolen, it's li she's liable? Because she borrowed. So she intended to have a dog. Okay. These are great ideas, These are great ideas, but we're looking to try to learn it out of the text, remember? Everybody here told me they don't want the interpretations from the Torah that they can't find in the Torah. Everybody said, we want to make sure the rabbis are not making it up. So Catherine, what you just said is considered made up. It's a great idea, I agree with you, but it's made up. Mm -hmm. We need something from the text. How can we learn from the two texts that we had, right? So text 6a and 6b, where we learned about a custodian is responsible for theft, but not responsible for death. Right? How can we learn out? About, and then we learned that a, 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 a borrower is responsible for, for debt. How can we learn out that a borrower is also liable for theft? Anybody? You could just look at the two words on the screen if you want to. <laughs> if, 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 you, if, you took a, if you took the, the animal, I, I think that you're, you're automatically assuming responsibility. Absolutely, David. I agree with you. But you're a rabbi and you just made it up. We need to do it from the text. Get it, get it from the text. Get it from the Torah. Come on, guys. You can do this. I told you it's hard stuff, but you can do this. It says, if it is stolen from him, he shall pay its owner. That was about a custodian. We're trying to figure out about someone who borrowed it. We're trying to use the exercise of Kalba Homer. If you borrow it, you become, you're taking responsibility for it. But you just made that up. It doesn't say that in the text. <laughs> okay, uh, then the opposite okay. of what it said. <laughs> Lisa, you want to go for it? Go for it. We're I'll looking try. for a Kalba Homer. We're looking for a Kalba Homer. Does everybody see the Kalba Homer on the board? Try to do yeah. that with the text. Go ahead, go, Lisa. Okay. If a man gives his neighbor uh, a donkey for s safekeeping, it's temporary. Um, okay. But if he, um, if the person borrows from his neighbor, yes, um, that's also then, temporary. Well, it's also temporary, but it's it, um, they don't know when they're going to give it back. Let's say they well, do know. So. Let's say it was one week. Let's say it was one week. Malika's okay. Malika's okay. husband He's is out of town. Responsible if the dog. Um, dies, then he's also responsible if it runs away. Awesome! Thank you, Elise. Let's get a round of applause for Elise. Uh, yeah. the Kalba <laughs> Homer. The, All right. So, we're taking if the you're boss, example and applying it to the lesser example, because exactly. So here we go, guys. Here we go. Here we go. We look at the text in six A. All right. We see All right. that 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 a custodian a custodian is responsible for for theft not responsible for death, okay? So which one are you, is like the hardest one to be responsible for? Death. Death is the hardest one to be responsible for, right? So death becomes right. our cow. Death becomes our, our uh, weak point. It's very hard to be right. responsible for death. And by the borrower, we already see that they're responsible for death. Certainly they're responsible for theft. No. So anything Everybody with me here. You see that, Catherine? Lisa, you with me? Yes. Guys, don't nod your head if you're not with me because we, we, I, I need you for the next part, all right? We're going to move on to the next one. Go Should from greater me? to lesser. Greater exactly. To lesser. You're going from lesser to greater. Exactly. Let's do this, Let's do this on the board, all right? 
Okay. We have a custodian. We have a borrower, all right? We have, if the animal dies naturally, and you're a custodian, the Torah tells us you're not liable. Then the Torah tells us that if the animal is stolen, you are liable. So which one is worse, stealing or dying naturally? Dying. Clearly, stealing is worse. Stealing is something you're more likely to be liable for. Dying naturally, not so bad. You're not, you're not so natural. So, right? Which, in other words, which one would you look at Malachi and say, oh my God, you terrible custodian. If it dies naturally, you might not necessarily say that about her. Whatever, it's not her fault, right? But if the animal is stolen, you would say that about it. Now comes the borrower, and the Torah tells us that for dying naturally, she's liable. Whoa, even for dying naturally, she's liable? I can derive from that. I can learn out from that, that if it's stolen, for sure, she's liable. All right? So, that's Kalva Homer number one. Okay, sorry. Um, Okay, so Kal Bachomer means from the lesser to, to the greater. Okay, is anybody sweating yet? I'm sweating. Anybody else sweating? Okay, no, we're I soon like, about. I like it. All right, you're soon about to start to start to perspire. I think perspire is more than sweating, right? If it is, then you're about to do that. Okay, that's Kal Bachomer number one. All right, here's the problem. <laughs> Kal Bachomer number one gets knocked out at the time when they say not a good Kal Bachomer. Not a good Kabbal Homer. Hold on, let me just make sure I present this to you properly. Um, I gave you actually. Hold on. Okay. Says the Gemara, says the Talmud, I like your Kalba Homer, but there's one major flaw. There's a problem. All right? Text 7a. David, you want to read for us? Here's the problem. I, I do not have the... Oh, sorry. Sorry. My bad. Arnold, you want to read for us? Text 7a. Again, I don't have my book with me. <laughs> Shimon, text 7a. <laughs> You guys are going to be doing a lot of reading today. Yeah. <clears throat> if the animal died or broke a limb, it's impossible for the owner to invest effort to retrieve it. But if the animal was stolen or lost, the owner can invest effort to retrieve it. Okay, says the Gemara, you all assumed that, that, the, that dying is automatically cow. That dying is automatically the thing which, you, which Malka, right? I, I, I asked you all if Malka would, if you would look at Malka as a bad custodian, if she, had show, if she tells me that, that the animal died on her watch, you all said, eh, not necessarily. But if it was stolen, that's terrible, right? But let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Malka's the custodian. She's supposed to do whatever's in her power to try to retrieve the animal. If the animal dies, can she do anything to get it back? No. No. What's about if the animal is stolen? Can she do something to get it back? Yes. So that's not a perfect, maybe I would say like this, you know why the borrower, right? Remember the borrowing situation? You know why the borrower is responsible to pay when the animal dies? Because there's no way to get it back. They can't say anything to the owner, oh, go get it back. It actually died. You're not going to be back my animal. But when it comes to it being stolen, maybe they can say, you know what? It was stolen. Go get it back. So maybe there is a difference there. Says the Gemara, your Kalvachomer is flawed. Your logic is flawed. And therefore, the Gemara comes up with the second Kalva Homer, all right? So here we go. We had Kalva Homer number one. If the animal dies naturally, we, 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 we immediately said that, 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 that the animal dying naturally, you're liable because it's easier to exempt the borrower, right? And if, if that's the case, then if it's stolen, where, where we have a question mark, the Torah doesn't tell us what to do, certainly if it's harder to exempt the borrower, certainly they'd be responsible. But what if the borrower is liable even when it was out of his or her control, right? The borrower should definitely be liable when there was something he or she could have done about it. In other words, this is the problem. This is the problem. This is the problem. This is the flaw in the logic. The, a the animal dies naturally. The borrower is liable when it was out of her control. 
that doesn't necessarily mean that, that they're liable and they could have done something about it. Right. Okay? That's why the Gemara introduces a new Kalvachomer. Here's the new one, all right? Text, uh, text 7b. Um, who still has? Lisa, you want to read for us? Text 7b is the you new Kalvachomer. You shall say a Kalvachomer. If a paid custodian who is exempt when the animal suffers a broken limb or death is liable when the animal is stolen or lost, then a borrower who is liable when the animal suffers a broken limb or death is certainly liable when the animal is stolen or lost. All right, so this, here we have a new Kalvachomer. Sorry? Go ahead. So this Kalvachomer is irrefutable. Right, so that's the, that's the end of the Talmud, Talmud, Talmud section there, that this Kalba Chomer is, is irrefutable, all right? So here's the new one, Kalba Chomer number two, okay? If it is easier to exempt, okay, the custodian, now we're not looking at, at the scenarios anymore. We're not looking at what happened. We're looking at the people. A custodian, is that somebody who has a lot of responsibility or doesn't? Custodian is clearly someone who we choose to say they're less responsible than a borrower. Most of you told me this, right? Most of you were telling me this from your own heads. A custodian is somebody who you pay to, to, to take care of something. They're only going to take care of it up to a certain point. A borrower, they chose to take the liability. They're responsible for everything across the board, right? right? So a, a custodian is cow. It is easier to exempt them. A borrower is chomer. It's much harder to exempt them, okay? So, if the custodian who is, who is exempt when the animal dies, right? In other words, he's easier to exempt, but he's still liable when it is stolen, than for sure someone who borrows, right? Who we said, really across the board, right? Should be responsible because they're harder to exempt. They chose to go into this. So then when the animal dies, they are certainly liable when it is stolen. And that yeah. is an irrefutable Kalba Okay. Uh, too. If, you, if you're giving custody to another person you're the one in down custody to them but if you're borrowing it you're saying i'm taking on custody of this thing you're initiating in both instances they're initiating which that I think, is very true that yeah. is very true it's, it's a very good point that you're making shimon again i'm, I'm going to stick to this because this is the point of today's lesson you made that up it's true and it's theoretical and it makes sense and it's, I mean, it's logical right. you're not inferring from the verse the point is here like this. Look, look at how we made the custodian somebody who's easier to exempt. You know how we know that the custodian is somebody who's easier to exempt? Because when the animal dies, he's not liable. He's exempt. So we know that the custodian is an easier to exempt person. The borrower is a, more, is a harder person to exempt because we see that even when it dies, he's liable. Does that make sense? So we got it from the yeah. verse. Are you with me here? Mm-hmm. Perhaps the reason for that, like you say, sorry, I clicked the wrong place again. Perhaps the reason for that, like you say, is because here he voluntarily chose to go into the, into the, into the, and that's probably the reason. But we need to see it somewhere in the verse. So therefore, we look at the laws we have, we try to answer the question mark. You saw how we made that table, and we had three of them that it said clearly in the verse, and we're trying to understand the fourth one. What is the law? And we have to figure that out from the three that we have. Just like Sudoku. Are you with me here? Yeah. Okay. Okay, sorry. Sorry that I keep sticking to that point, but I, I, it, the purpose of this lesson is to show us how hermeneutic principles or, or the 13 principles of Rabbi Ishmael are actually clear guidelines whenever we're trying to learn out, and that this is what tractate after tractate and Talmudic, Talmudic section after Talmudic section deals with. This is what you do. I spend, I think, about seven hours a week doing this. With person, um, with me, I do a lot, a lot of private tutoring and classes that I lead. And you know, my Pinson gives a Talmud class on Tuesdays. This is what we do in the Talmud. This is what we do. We try to break them apart. Hmm. I'm doing this now with, with, with a teenage boy and girl. Some of you may know them, the Khan, uh, 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 the Khan family. They have a boy and a girl who are teenage. And, and, and they look at me with these glazed eyes like you guys do. And I hold them tight and I say, stay with me. Stay with me. We're going to do this. We're going to get through this. So at the end, it's going to make sense. And you're going to realize that there's no other way that the Torah could have meant it. Okay? So, and, 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 by the way, we're done. We're done the first one. Okay? We're going to move on to rule number two, which is an easier one. This was the hard one to get through. 
But let me explain to you what we did here, okay? Let me explain to you what we did here. We hopefully, hopefully, by the end of today's lesson, you'll walk out with a feeling of like the next time somebody says, oh, the rabbi just made it up. You'll be like, are you kidding me? They made it up. They took a verse. Now, we're not talking about rabbis, me, Rabbi Anok, Rabbi Pinson. You know what rabbis for generations are doing this. And, and, and by the way, the Talmud is not over, over 50 years. The Talmud is over hundreds of years. They, they would do it, and then 150 years later, it would be challenged. You understand? And we're still doing that today. We challenge back and forth. We try to make sure we understand it until we get to the complete understanding of what God would have wanted. Based on two things. First of all, we have, remember, remember the Sudoku? The Sudoku, you were armed with two things. You were armed with the existing letters, yeah. and you were armed with the rules of the game. Here we have exactly the same thing. We are armed with the words of Torah Shemichtab, the, the written Torah, as well as the, the, the received Torah that we got directly from Sinai, which was passed down to us person to person. And then we are armed with the rules of the game. 13 of them, not so many. It's less rules than there are in Settlers of Catan. That's one of my favorite games. Less rules than there are in Settlers of Catan, there are in the game of Torah. But those 13 rules, we hold you accountable to them no matter what. So one rule we, we did so far was a Calva Homer. Let's do a Binyan Av. All right? You guys ready? <clears throat> Nobody? Nobody's ready? <laughs> Go. No. <laughs> okay, here comes a Binyan Av. A Binyan Av is as follows. A Binyan Av means... Okay. Uh, we have a figure. Um, on, on, we, we have figure 2.4 on page 50. But before we get to that, let me do it with you on the board, okay? A Binyan Av means... I have a rule, I'm gonna lay down a rule, okay? Let's give an example here. If your boss tells you you can't eat lunch at your desk, okay? <laughs> I hope nobody has bosses like in these analogies. I hope your boss does not like this. I really would feel bad for you and hopefully get you employed, else, employed elsewhere. Um, your boss tells you you cannot eat lunch at your desk. All right, what about breakfast? Can you eat breakfast at your desk? One day you come late to work. You usually <laughs> eat breakfast at home. Anybody? No, no, anybody say yes. No, we got any no, guesses? because it's, no. it's a very similar situation. Probably it's the same. Okay, so here's what you're doing. Your boss tells you you cannot eat lunch at your desk. You create a binyan av. The words literally mean building a father. Okay, in other words, what you're doing is you're creating a parent law. You're creating a parent mm -hmm. law that will have many children that are very similar to this one. And even though they're not exactly the same, you can basically say, all right, it's in the same category. I disagree. Okay? What do you mean you disagree? I disagree because the lunch is in the middle of the work day and there are other people around. So it might be, it might be frowned upon because there are other people around. If you eat breakfast before work starts and no one else is around at your desk to eat breakfast, then, then there's not the same problem. I love it. Shimon, I love it. I love, love, love it. Binyan Av is not, is not ironclad. We have to figure out if this binyanav makes perfect sense. So whatever, first of all, your binyanav cannot be illogical. There has to be some reason you're saying the two are together. Okay, so Elise and everyone else said, binyanav, it's a parent law. If you can't eat lunch, you probably can't eat breakfast. It's just another meal. The fact that it's another meal doesn't make a difference. You cannot eat at your desk, right? But if somebody else comes and says, hmm, this binyanav smells a little screwy. Why? Because it's not a perfect binyanav. Maybe the real parent law should be, Eating in the middle of the day is not allowed. The beginning of the day, at the end of the day, you're good to go. But eating in the middle of the day is not allowed, like Shimon is saying. In other words, there is a binyan av here. There is a category. There is a parent law, but you need to figure out exactly what it is. You cannot just say, oh, they seem similar enough, right? Anybody see the picture on the left? Yeah. What's the picture on the left? Oh, no. Apples. Two apples. Two apples. apples. One of them is green. One of them is red. But what if there was an apple and there was an orange? Everybody would look at me and say, Rabbi, you're talking apples and oranges, right? In mm -hmm. other words, your category right. has to actually make sense. It has to actually work and be upheld and not be able to be challenged, all right? One's red and one's green, though. Yeah, <laughs> very good. But unless you can tell me what the difference is between the red and the green, if you cannot give me any reason why they should have different laws, then we're going to treat it the same, okay? It's Let's do one inside. Shimon, let's do one inside. Okay, let's not stay for too long on the lunch and the breakfast. All right? Here we go. Um, oh, actually, before we... Yeah, okay. We're good to go. So text 8A, we have an example. All right? Um, Malka, set us, set us up. Give us a scenario. Oh, here, wait, wait. You want me to read that? 
Yes, that's A day. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. If a person grazes his livestock in a field or a vineyard and lets his livestock loose so that it grazes in another's field, he must make restitution with the best of the field and the best of his vineyard. Okay. This is a verse from the Torah. Fact is, if you have a dog and your dog gets let, get, uh, runs off the leash or whatever, <laughs> you know, the other, uh, the other week, um, Gitti and I uh, decided that because we really owe the Hanoka family a tremendous debt of gratitude, meaning all the children, because they really helped us all move. Many of you know that I moved within my, my complex. I moved from unit to unit because of a price reduction, whatever. So um, we self-moved, and all of the Hanoka kids helped us out, you know, bringing everything from the old house to the new house. And um, so we decided we're going to take the family out because uh, that's probably the, the best uh, gift you could give someone these days is to take them out of the house. So we said we're going to take them all out. We will go to a kosher restaurant. We'll order food because nobody's having dine-in. We'll pick it up. We went to LA Burger Bar. We picked up some good food. We went to a park in Beverly Hills. I forgot what it was called. Beautiful park. We sit down on the grass. We brought picnic materials. It was gorgeous. We had a beautiful picnic. This was for dinner. And then we took them to go see, we had our masks on, and we took them to go see the waves, the luminescent waves. Did everybody see that? The, the blue waves? Oh, the, the wow. Blowing. Yeah. All right. We had a good time. about that. We're, we're sitting on the blanket at the park, and um, <laughs> we have, like, you know, burgers and hot dogs and french fries and salads sitting on the, on the blanket. And from, I, I kid you not, must have been 400 feet away, someone's dog... Yeah, it was a big park. 400 feet away, someone's dog comes running, bounding across the field to us. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank God for us. It was an obedient dog. And, and I, I said, sit. And he just sat down and started to play with me. It, it turned into the most fun. And, and the, the owners came running right behind them. And it was just a fun story. And they weren't, eating, they, they weren't eating our lunch. It was a little bit of a breaking of the boundaries of social distancing, probably a little closer than we would have liked to be. But OK, we, we got past <laughs> and we moved on. Um, so. In text 8a, the Torah lays down that if you are a dog owner, it's your responsibility to keep your dog on a leash. Your dog cannot be grazing in someone else's field. If you own any animal, you cannot have your animal floating around somebody else's field and eating. Okay? If they do, you have to pay for it. Says the Torah. What was the word? The best. The best of his field and the best of his vineyard he needs to pay. All right? Okay. Um, what does the best mean? So a little Talmudic background here back in Talmudic times. In ancient agricultural Israel, there were three categories of fields. There was idit, which means preferred fields, benonit, which are average fields, ziburit, or inferior fields. This is talking about the quality of the field in terms of how much grain we think can grow from it, how much potential it has, etc. Right now, if someone owes you money, right? So, so let's say it was Malka. Malka's Malka. I apologize. I keep picking on you. <laughs> Malka's dog grazed in my field. Now she owes me, let's say, a hundred bucks because it ate $100 worth of my field. Malka doesn't have 100 bucks, all right? So we go to her property. She happens to be a property conglomerate. She owns tons of property across the whole San Gabriel Valley. Lots of fields, lots of mountains, hikes, things. You can do whatever you want. Malka chooses what she's going to pay me from, right? She goes, you know what? I'm going to pay you from the, from the grossest field that I have. I'll just give you more in quantity like that. It'll equal 100 bucks. Says the Torah, you're not allowed to. You have to pay for the best. All right. Fair enough. Says the Mechilta de Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who was reading for us? I think it was Malka. Malka, keep going. Text 8b. He must make restitution with the best of his field and the best of his vineyard. This is a binyan, uh, binyan of, for in any case where someone pays restitution, the court appraises and restitution is provided from the offender's preferred field. Oh, wow. So he says, what I want to try to do, Shimon, are you ready to attack? He says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make this a category. We're going to make this apparent law. Anytime someone needs to pay restitution, anytime someone needs to pay back someone else, they got to pay for the best of their field. So look at the picture, right? Anybody seeing how we can start to apply this to modern times? You bump into somebody's car, you don't have money to pay, you're going to take from your property, it has to be from the best. You can't give them crummy property, it has to be from the best. Right? That is opinion of in the Torah. Let's see 
one instance where the binyan av is going to be rejected. Text nine a. Sure, go for it. If if the animal grazes on an inferior field, are you saying they should the person should repay from a field that's above the inferior field? Absolutely. I didn't say it. The Torah said it. Look inside text eight a. Yeah. No, I understand that, but. Yeah. If you're paying back someone else, which means you're the person who's in the wrong here, says the Torah, don't start giving away crummy stuff. By the way, let me, let me clarify something. I skipped over this because I felt like it wasn't important. This is not the case by a debtor. Shimon, if you borrow 100 bucks from me, and then, heaven forbid, you go, you go down on your luck and you can't pay me back, but you do have property, you're allowed to give me from the worst of your property, as long as you pay me back 100 bucks. 100 bucks is 100 bucks. But if you're somebody who's... And, 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 and we could sit here and guess the minister a reason for the Torah. The fact is, this is what the Torah says. If, if, if you've wronged someone else, you have to pay for the best. All right. Then that wait, was one so big... Yes. With the car then, let's take a car example. Say I smash yes. into uh, a uh, $20,000 car or something. Are you yes. saying that if there's a better car, you should give them a higher price? Pause. Pause. I'm saying you have to give them back $20,000. If you damage $20,000 worth, you have to give them back $20,000. Even if you're giving them property, you still need to give them $20,000 worth of property. The question yeah. is, I can give you $20,000 worth of crummy property, which is probably going to be better, uh, sorry, which is probably going to be more property. Okay. Or I can give you $20,000 of quality property, which will be less. Okay. Either way, I'm paying you in full, and I'm only paying you the amount that I owe you. But, says the Torah, a debtor is allowed to pay from his worst, a, an offender is allowed to pay from his, from his best. Not, not as allowed to, has to pay from his best. Okay, that was one big enough. Let's do another one. Um, who else has their book? I think Shimon has his book, right? I'm oh, sorry, Lisa, you have your book. Go for it. Text 9A. When you come to work in your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat as many grapes as you desire to satisfy your hunger. However, you may not put any into your receptacle. Okay. Uh, uh, hold on. Yeah, okay. So this is a law. It's a simple law. It's about someone who works in a, uh, a grape uh, factory or whatever, right? A grape uh, vineyard. He's the one who picks the grapes for the owner. There's a law in the Torah that you're not allowed to put somebody to work in a field and not allow them to eat from that. It's, it's sadistic. You're not allowed to have him picking grapes and tell him but he's not allowed to eat any of the grapes. You have to allow him to eat the grapes. But says the Torah, you're not allowed to take you're not allowed to take them, put them in your pocket to bring them home. He's okay. allowed to eat as many grapes as he wants on the field. This is the law in the Torah. Okay. But then he is text, he allowed to eat it during the time that he's working, or can he stay after work in the field and eat a few more? No, no, no. While he works. That's clear in the Torah. It says so. Okay. Oh, okay. it's Menachem time. Everybody say goodnight to Menachem. Good night. Good night. Say bye bye. Bye. Say hi. Say hi. Hi. Now say bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye so, what about an orange grove? A worker that's picking grapes is allowed to eat as he works. What about an orange, it an orange picker? He doesn't say why. Well. Uh, I, I know, but there's more context there. There's more context there. Shimon, let's leave that aside for a moment. What about an orange grove? Right? We're trying to make a pinyin of. At least you say sure, why not, sure. right? The Talmud right. says so as well. Lisa, please continue reading for us. Text 9b. Okay. We have a biblical source for the case of a vine, a vineyard. From where do we know that the law applies to all fields? We de derive it from the vineyard. Just as with the vineyard, whose distinctive attribute is that it grows from the soil, the law is that an employee is allowed to, gr to eat of it during the harvest. So too, every produce that grows from the soil an employee is allowed to eat of the harvest. Yeah. Sounds good so far, right? Says the Gemara, not yeah. so fast. Right? Sounds good. Says the Gemara, not so fast. Grapes. Uh, yeah, okay. And now what's the binyanav? The binyanav is grapes grow from the ground, 
orange is broken the ground, so it's a parent category. They all belong to the same thing. That's why a worker may eat oranges as he works. Says the t- says the, t- the Gemara not so fast. Hold it up. Text nine C. Lisa, keep us going. What comparison can you make to a vineyard which is subject to the obligation of olodot? Says the Gemara, oh, 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 oh. there's a huge so, oh, difference oh, oh, oh. between between grapes and oranges. A huge difference. There is a law in the Torah with regards to grapes, an agricultural law, which we don't find by any other fruit, and that is as follows. Um, raise your hand if anybody's ever heard of these agricultural laws, like leaving the corner of your field for the poor people. Has anybody yeah. ever heard of this? Okay, a lot of people raising their hands. There's another one you may or may not have heard of. If you have grapes growing in bunches and clusters on the tree, if, if a cluster grows and it's kind of uneven, it's, it's, no, it's, not, so, it's not the best one, right? It, it's not full, you have to leave it on the tree for the poor people. Grapes are the only thing. Everything else has all these agricultural laws. Grapes have this one additional one. Says the Gemara, maybe, maybe that's why the Torah uses grapes, because grapes are different. Boom, and just like that, the Binyan is gone. All right? So you have to have a common denominator as you, as you move along. Um, but that common denominator also, there cannot be any, uh, 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 um, uh, you know, something special about one of them, particularly the one that the Torah is telling us about. You'd be like, oh, that's why the Torah mentioned that one. It has to be that the Torah kind of just chose one, at least so far as we can tell, the Torah just chose one, and that it's going gonna, it's gonna to work across the board because you're going to find a rule that's going to... Uh, 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 that, uh, 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 a way to turn it into a category that anything within that category is going to work. All right. That was a hard one and an easy one. All right. This is an easy one. Binyanav. So we've got two of them. We've got two of the, of the, the 13 principles, the 13 rules by which we do derivation from the Torah. Let's talk about why this, what, this is such a perfect system, right? Because let me ask you a question. Right now, right about now, most of you are probably thinking, I, I, I don't know, but I'm going to assume that many of you are thinking like this. All right, Rabbi, I get it. It's not an ideal system. Ideally, God would have written every single, like let's say this law. God would have told us, if, if a person works in a field, and I don't care if it's a grape vineyard or if it's an orange grove or if it's an apple orchard, and the Torah would have listed them all. And it, that was really the ideal way for the Torah to do it. But it's just impossible because you cannot encompass every single scenario that's going to come up over the course of history in one book and, and expect people to read it, learn it, and live by it. It's just impossible. So therefore, Hashem gave it to us and gave us rules, and they're pretty good rules, but it's not really an ideal system. Ideally, God would have given us all of the laws, you know, laid out in front of us. We said God doesn't want to make miracles, so that's why he did it this way. <clears throat> Let me explain to you something. My friends, it's much deeper than that. There is a tremendous benefit, there's a tremendous value to having a system like this, Okay. I don't know how many of you experienced it, but your neshama just went through something very, very powerful. Okay? Over the past half an hour, when we went through this kalvachomer, this binyanav, and we cracked our brains, and some of you were sweating, and we were very, we were so deep into it, we were connecting with God on a level that, to be honest, before the Torah, and before this concept of deriving from the Torah existed, was not possible. All right? Catherine, you want to read for us text 10a? A parable, a king decreed the Romans may not go down to Syria, and the Syrians may not go up to Rome. Similarly, when God created the world, he decreed the heavens are the domain of God, and the earth he has given to the children of Adam. Psalms 115 and 16. But when God sought to give the Torah, he nullified the original decree and said, those below may ascend above, and those above may descend below. So, thank you, Catherine. So when Hashem created the world, there was this divide. He said, I'm really creating two worlds. There's the spiritual and there's the physical, and they don't connect. They never meet, okay? There was what we call Elyonim, those that belong to the upper world, stuff, those that were spiritual, whether you call them angels, whether you call them Spirot, or what you call, whatever you call it. There was the Alyonim, and there was the Tachtonim. There was us, and animals, and, and the physical world. That was us, physical, and then there was the spiritual. And those two worlds never connected. They were like taking an opposite and a positive, uh, uh, taking two magnets, and they repel each other. Right? Mm-hmm. When Hashem gave us the Torah, Hashem said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nullify that decree. 
I want to create, via the Torah, a fusion between the physical and the spiritual. And from that moment forward, there was the ability for a human being to transcend himself, his, his, his normal, usual physical self, and fuse with the divine, or fuse, uh, uh, become unified, become one with the Elyoni, with the upper realms, with the spiritual. And this happens through the study of Torah. Think about it. What did we just do? We said, we're going to come up with our own laws that are not necessarily godly, right? But we're going to read here. So, 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 so meaning, there, we can choose to, to come up with our own laws that are not godly. That would be physical. That would be just being tachtonim. That would be being physical people. Or we can choose to look into the Torah, read, hear, memorize God, laws that are godly, but are not very human. And then we can choose to fuse the two. The perfect synthesis is when human beings toil with their own minds to reveal the divine attempt to better the Torah. Let's try to use the Torah as an anchor. Let's try to use the Torah as our pathway, as our ma matrix, as our, our red pill or whatever you have, you have it, right? To enter this other world and then bring that world into this world, make them one. Can I ask Let's enter God's mind, quote unquote. Let's get really nitty gritty about it. Let's really understand it. Let's really try to figure it out. And then let's become one with it. And then most importantly, let's bring it down into this world and apply it to this physical world. Let's, let's actually act based on it. Let's actually use it in a physical way. In that way, we take our own mind and we take God, God's mind and we fuse ourselves together. And that is something, my friends, first of all, that cannot be accomplished by reading the Torah. When we just take, when we read, God created the heaven and the earth. There's us, there's the Torah, and it's two separate things. We just happen to be reading the Torah right now. When we study the oral Torah, and we're deriving from the Torah, oh my God, we're, we're literally connected with Hashem in such a way with our minds and His mind, with our wisdom and His wisdom, in a way that we really, I, I, I don't know of any other way that we could. In Tanya, this is discussed as the, the ultimate way that we could. And that's the ideal system to use to govern ourselves. Not a physical system, also not a spiritually removed system, a fusion of the two together. Can Let's see. Question? Yes. So on a fundamental level, how can we ever really understand what's in God's mind or what God really wants? Because God's so superior to us and he thinks on a completely, I, I believe that God's intellect and thought processes is way above our own. own. Yeah, way above us. So how can we even like hope to have the same thought process as God? That doesn't actually make sense to me. And That's a great of, question. Yeah. Sorry. That's a great, great question because God is so superior to us. Hmm. And we believe that as part of the Torah. Um, I would say you're correct if we were trying to do this without any instruction. In other words, if we were just saying, ooh, this looks like a fun activity, then you'd be correct. The difference is we're not talking about just doing this randomly, just trying to understand God. We're doing this, first of all, at God's instruction. B, with God's guidance. In other words, through the Torah and through the principles which he told us to learn the Torah. And then he gave us actually one of the 613 principles is to study the Torah. So we, we're actually commanded by God to try to understand him. So do I believe that we'll ever really reach the full understanding of God? No. But we can reach an understanding of God which God allows us to. Something okay. which he has gifted to us through the Torah. Does okay. that answer your question? It does, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Shimon, one second. This might become a little bit clearer with text 10b. Why don't you read for us? Go ahead. The difference between a written Torah and the oral Torah is that God spoke the written Torah and Moses wrote it, which is given completely from above, whereas the oral Torah requires human contribution. A student must toil intellectually to introduce novel Torah ideas. And that's what I said earlier. The truth, however, is that the derived oral Torah was also given a Mount Sinai, meaning even that which people comprehend with their own minds is God's Torah. Thereby, the purpose of the given Torah is met, and there should be a bonding of the lofty with the mundane. When we introduce Torah's concepts from our own minds, God's Torah becomes our Torah. Is it like when, when a teacher really wants a student to understand, 
he gets the student to then teach it. Is that where he's endowing that uh, process? Um, maybe even a step before that. He, when, a, when a teacher feels like if he gives over material to a student, it'll be too obvious. So he says, you know what, I'm going to give you a couple pieces of, of information. You figure out the rest. I believe that you can do this on your own. But really, he's coming to the exact point that the teacher wants him to do based on the few pieces of information that he gave him. Okay. And then they make it uh, their own. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then they make it their own. Let me clarify, by the way, that this is not something that's just supposed to be for rabbis. You know, in, 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 the, sec in the secular legal system, we have basically said there's a certain segment of the population, we call them lawyers. We say, we task you with spending all of your years studying the law and coming up with the law and figuring it out. Because this is such a powerful gift that Hashem gave us, he didn't leave it for a proud few. Not only rabbis are supposed to study Torah, the whole reason why we're sitting here and studying Torah together is because everybody's supposed to study Torah. Right? Look at text 11. Um, Lisa, you want to read for us? Sure. Every one of us is able to reveal secrets of wisdom, to reveal and to innovate new insights in Halakha, Agadah, in the, the revealed dimensions of Torah and in the Kabbalistic sphere. Indeed, we are obliged to do so in order to perfect our souls. Okay, so it, this is an integral duty on every single Jew to do this and to try their best to, to get involved in this system. Um, but, but the million dollar question still remains, right? Shimon still wants to know, did we get it right? Did we get it right? I can't believe that God would, would send us down here and say, Spend all your days breaking your heads and, and, and we'll never know if we got it right. So the answer is that yes, that's definitely a big part of it. We never will know if we got it right and that's very, very important. In order that this continues to happen, we continue to try to, to challenge it and to work it and work it and work it based on the rules that I shall give us in order to try to get it as right as we can. But there is some overlap between the Torah which we learned, to, the oral Torah which we learned about last week, which was points. I think there's like a list of 200 of them that the Rambam Maimonides this, um, you know, details, whether it's what an etrog looks like or what the filling looks like, etc. cetera. Um, the, what we call the received part of the oral Torah and the derived part of the oral Torah, right? There, are, there is some overlap between those two. Um, and, and they occur every once in a while. And it's almost like just for fun. <laughs> um, and they, they give us some very, very interesting perspective. Let's see one example of one of them. Malka, text uh, 12a. We're back to the beginning of last week's lesson, the, the, the milk and meat, right? Okay. The Torah states, you shall not cook a kid in its mother's milk. The received oral Torah teaches us that this verse forbids both the cooking and the eating of milk with meat. Okay. Wow. All right. So we have two things so far. We have the written Torah, and then we have the received oral Torah. In other words, this is all information that's coming directly from God. What do we have so far? We have uh, three points and three points, okay? So the written Torah tells us, first of all, um, so meaning, meaning we get six points in total, three from the written Torah, three from the received oral Torah. The written Torah tells us, you now let a cook a young goat in its mother's milk. The orally received Torah tells us, it's not just cooking, cooking and eating, and it's not just a young goat, it's all meat. And it's not just its mother's milk, it's really all milk, any kind of milk, right? Okay. Um, but even though we get this directly from Sinai, the written Torah, the orally received Torah, we do find, and Malta's going to read for us in just a moment, the text 12b, that uh, there is some deriving going on over here. There is some learning out and figuring it out from verses. Let's see, Malta, go ahead. 12b. You shall not cook a kid in its mother's milk. This prohibits cooking the mixture and through a call, how can I pronounce it? That's the first one. Right. We derive that one may not eat this mixture. So he says, look, look what I'm circling right now with my cursor. He says, the written Torah says cooked. You know how you know you're even not allowed to eat it? He says, it's a Kalba Homer. It's a Kalba Homer, right? Um, David, if your mom tells you, don't even touch that cake that I made this morning, it's for something special, right? Can you go and eat it? Your mom only said you can't touch it, <laughs> right? David wouldn't be yeah, around well. today if he had done that, <laughs> right? Of course you can't eat it, right? So it says, this mechilta, 
that this is how it works. It's a Kabbalah Homer. The Torah tells us now that a cook, we know certainly we cannot eat. So I don't get it. Is it received or is it derived? Malka, finish off for us. Text 12c. There are laws that were received from Moses, but the sages proved them by means of the 13 rules. The ingenious structure of this particular passage enables us to find hints for specific received laws. So, it turns out that sometimes it comes from both. Sometimes there is received Torah, and there's derived Torah, and it's really derived, but Hashem gives us small things that we can rely on in order to say, oh, oh, see, see, we got it right here. We got it right this time. So what is the benefit of deriving laws that were already received? Why would we spend time, right, we're on page 57 here, for those who don't have the textbook. Why would we spend time on an exercise that we seemingly know the result to already? Right? Here's a couple reasons. One reason is, perhaps, even though we saw in, in the last lesson that Hillel and Shammai said they had, they had two Torahs, the written Torah and the oral Torah, we don't want this to be understood literally. We don't want people to think there's two separate Torahs, the written Torah and the oral Torah. We want people to see the connection between the two of them. We want to see people to see a Kavachomer at work and then actually see that in the oral law. We want people to see it in the words and then see it in the oral law. In other words, even though you have the written law and the oral law, you want them very often to cross paths in order that people should understand that these are not two separate Torahs, right? And of course, we're always going to have that benefit, even though we might already know from the received oral Torah, if we can figure it out from the Kabbalah Homer, we've had that deep, intimate connection with God. When our mind warps itself around his mind, remember that? We have that deep connection with God. And that, my friends, is something that's so powerful that we never would have gotten just from last week from the received oral Torah. Was that's just a list of things that's being passed down to us. And we know for sure it's true. We don't need to spend time talking about them. All the rest of it that we need to derive out of it, that's where we get to fuse with Hashem. That's where, like Shimon said, like the student who gets to make it his, he gets to bring himself to the, to the Torah. And that's actually, as the altar ever said, is an obligation of every single Jew to do throughout his time. So thank you all for joining us for lesson two of uh, Judaism Decoded. Um, which we call the ciphering code. Um, there's really a video to play at the end here, but it, it doesn't really add that much. And I feel like I've kept you guys already 10 minutes over time. So we'll end the lesson here. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. Can I, <clears throat> can I add something? Absolutely, go for it. Um, to me, it's also the, to glorify Hashem through the way we, uh, we live our lives through you know okay but that 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 would be true even if hashem just told us to put on tefillin and we put on tefillin we would be glorifying hashem by the way by the way we act in our lives but now we're looking to glorify not just glorify hashem, but to, to connect with hashem to become one with right. hashem by, by actually connecting with his Torah. does that make sense mm -hmm. right okay so next please join us next week for lesson three power of the people Thank you very much.